Well, welcome everybody to HydroTerra's latest webinar. Today, we're looking at advances in acid rock drainage, new approaches to prevention and remediation. We're very fortunate to have John Webb, Emeritus Professor in Environmental Geoscience from La Trobe University. Before we start, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land. And for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydra Terra respectfully acknowledges the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today. And we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. There's a picture of myself and John. A little bit about today's presenter. Well, I've just had a good chat to John and there's some interesting things here. So John is a Queenslander. Um, uh, it would appear that Queenslanders of the web variety have a longevity. His father is still alive and he is 101 years old. The secret to a long life, apparently he's never had a drink and he's never had a smoke. So uh, interesting, we're going to be dealing with John for a fair while too, I suspect. Um, John is an Emeritus Professor of Environmental Geoscience at La Trobe University. He started his academic uh, life at University of Queensland. He specialises in groundwater geochemistry, including at contaminated sites, and is involved in research projects on improving treatment procedures for acid mine drainage and on the origin of springs in central Queensland. He also works in geomorphology, particularly landscape evolution and cast geomorphology and geoarchaeology, including artefact and ochre sourcing. He has supervised over 100 honours students and 30 PhD students and published over 150 papers. He's been actively involved in this acid rock drainage, which we used to call acid mine drainage, for more than 20 years. And uh, today's presentation really is a great collation of that knowledge that John has built up over that period. Um, we'd love to get your questions, so please use the Q&A uh, button at the top of your screen to log those questions, and I will read those questions out at the end of the presentation. Why does HydroTerra do these webinars? Well, it's great to keep in touch, obviously, but we do believe in sharing knowledge. We like to take a facilitatory role in education, and we like to be an industry leader. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to you, John. Thank you, Richard. Um, so what I should say to begin with is this is a bit of an idiosyncratic take on acid rock drainage um, based on my experience in the topic over a number of years. So it's not a comprehensive coverage of the topic by any means, although we'll start out with a general introduction. Next slide. So I need to acknowledge um, who, people that have helped me along the way, um, particularly Jeff Taylor at Earth Systems, who suggested some of these projects and helped with the supervision. Chuck Cravotta in the US and Ira Sosowski, who both helped me with particular things. Um, but particularly, I've had a lot of excellent students over the years whose names are listed here, who've done a great job at working on different aspects of acid rock drainage. And I'm going to present the results of some of their work today. So acid rock drainage is due to oxidation of pyrite. Basically, there are a few other minerals we'll talk about briefly. When pyrite forms under particular conditions, such that when it's exposed to oxygen at the Earth's surface, it alters quite quickly, um, and it's a redox reaction. So it, um, the sulfur in the pyrite oxidizes to sulfate, and it's oxidized by oxygen, which is itself reduced to the oxygen in the sulfate molecule. The Fe2+, the ferrous iron that's produced by that, is then oxidized to Fe3+, um, again, normally by oxygen, which in this case is reduced to water. Now, this step of the three reactions here can be the slowest. 
and it's actually microbially catalyzed. Thiobacillus ferrooxidans um, increases the rate of this reaction by orders of magnitude. And then finally, the Fe3 plus will precipitate as ferric hydroxide. And that's not an oxidation reduction reaction, but it generates acidity. And those three reactions, when you put them together, mean one mole of pyrite generates four moles of acidity. Um, pyrite can also be oxidized by Fe3 plus, um, the reaction at the bottom there. Um, so that means once the reaction starts, it doesn't necessarily need oxygen to keep it going. Next slide. So just a couple of examples of what we're talking about here. The acid released is able to disintegrate rocks um, that we see in the left there. And the difference between ferrous and ferric states of oxidation states of iron, illustrated by that slide showing that ferric is typically orangey brown in color and ferrous is a dark green. Next. So acid rock drainage has always high acid, iron and sulphate concentrations. Um, but that's not the whole story. Um, because lots of metals uh, have increased solubility at low pH, you can get lots of other things in acid rock drainage apart from iron. Um, typically, there are high levels of aluminium and often copper and zinc. And these can be up to hundreds of milligrams a litre. And there are many other metals um, often present at lower concentrations, including some very toxic ones like arsenic and cadmium. And so as a result, acid rock drainage is um, a big problem. It can kill vegetation and ecosystems, um, can be responsible for fish kills in particular situations. It corrodes infrastructure and equipment and it pollutes drinking and agricultural water. So it's really important that it doesn't leave mine sites and there's a lot of work that goes into ensuring that um, doesn't happen these days. So the cost of management, I've put in some figures here, these are out of date, but they give you an idea of the amount of money people are spending uh, trying to manage acid mine drainage and how much it costs to retroactively remediate a site. And the global estimates, um, they're the 16 to 167 billion is probably an underestimate. Uh, next. So a few photos, um, up the top there, we've got one of the biggest um, acid rock drainage sites in Australia, which is the Queen River in Tasmania. Um, this is a legacy site where there's lots of acid drainage coming out of old workings, um, going down the Queen River, which is very heavily polluted and doesn't have a lot of stuff living in it, except um, a single species of algae, which you can see there on the left and then actually goes out and forms a delta into Macquarie Harbour and the orangey colour of the delta sediments there indicates that they're still acid producing. Down the bottom we see typical um, colours of acid drainage around mine sites, um, which can be, as I was just discussing with Richard before, um, surprisingly beautiful. Um, the most um, beautiful site I ever saw was in the US actually, which was a stream draining a coal mine site uh, in spring. It was going through a deciduous forest, the dogwoods were in bloom, the stream was crystal clear and the bed of the stream was brilliant yellow and it was absolutely stunningly beautiful. But of course the stream was completely dead. There was nothing living in it at all. So the beauty has a dark side. Next slide. John, just a question. So with the Queen River discharged out into the marine environment does the do the contaminants precipitate out when they hit the marine waters is there a sort of uh, or is it they do they do so um it runs out in macquarie harbour which is a very large body of water and uh fortunately um the um contaminants um, precipitate out reasonably quickly and are also strongly diluted by the big volume of water there Um, this one I just threw in because it always kind of amused me. Um, on the right hand side there is a pond where at this mine site they pump all the acid drainage before they treat it. Um, but just behind where I've taken the photograph is uh, a life ring so that if you accidentally slipped into this pond which is extremely acid with very high levels of toxic metals, um, you could be thrown a life raft so that before you swallowed anything and um, died of poisoning you could be pulled out. 
Uh, next slide, sorry. Okay, other sulfides. So there are other sulfides that can contribute to acid rock drainage, but really they're not as significant as pyrite. Pyrotite um, does oxidize and does form acidity, but um, it frequently generates elemental sulfur. And if it precipitates in that way, it actually uses up acid rather than releasing it. Chalcopyrite will definitely generate acidity, but it's actually um, not nearly as reactive as pyrite. And as it says there, it's one of the more resistant sulfides to oxidation. Next. Um, galena and sphalerite, when they oxidize, don't release acidity um, normally um, when they're oxidized by oxygen. If they're oxidized by Fe3+, um, they can generate acidity, but if the Fe3 plus has been generated by Fe2 oxidation, um, that uses up an H plus, so there's no net generation of acidity. So what that means is um, around mine sites that are characterized by lots of galena and sphalerite, um, often the drainage is circumneutral, and uh, so it's often called neutral mine drainage. Um, however, it can contain elevated levels of some metals, most commonly zinc and cadmium. And the cadmium comes out of the um, sphalerite at the mine sites. Um, interestingly enough, although these sites are um, often characterized by large amounts of galena, lead isn't a big problem in the drainage because it's actually strongly adsorbed on any ferry hydrite that's around, whereas zinc and cadmium are not. And lead can also precipitate as various secondary minerals, carbonates and sulfates, whereas zinc and cadmium tend not to precipitate. Um, any pyrite at these sites can generate acidity, um, but that tends to be neutralized either by calcite veins within the deposit or the host rock. Um, a lot of these um, lead and zinc deposits are in limestones, and so they get neutralized quite quickly. Next slide. When you're dealing with uh, galena and sphalerite, and you mentioned that it, it may not actually affect the net acidity, does that mean pH in that scenario would not be a great way to monitor for acid rock drainage? Yeah, so um, these are called neutral mine drainage because the pH is typically around about seven. Um, and in, compared to um, acid sites, these have quite low levels of metals. So um, okay. zinc and cadmium levels there are quite low. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so um, this is a site I worked on at the in the uh, Lake District and the Pennines, North Pennines in the UK. And uh, I would say that the um, the view of the mine on the left-hand slide, that uh, left-hand photo there, I never saw it looking like that. It was always covered in misty rain when I was there. Um, but the zinc concentrations there are three milligrams a litre and the cadmium about 15 micrograms a litre. So they're significant and there's a treatment plant there. You can see the um, ponds in the middle of the slide where it's treated for removal. Um, even though those levels look small compared to acid rock drainage sites, the overall flux, particularly when you take it across the whole of the country is really significant. And so um, in the UK, they've put a lot of time and energy into um, treating that mine drainage. Uh, next slide. Okay, so ARD sources, as we've said, are a lot of metal mines. Um, coal mines, particularly in uh, the eastern US, northeastern US, also are strong acid rock drainage um, sources. Uh, in Australia, it's not nearly to the same extent. There are only a few coal mines in Australia that have an acid rock drainage issue. And um, that's because they're associated with much less pyrite than the ones in the States, which actually is um, a function of the uh, amount of marine sediments associated with the coal um, bearing strata, much less in Australia. Um, another source I just put in here to discuss very briefly is acid sulfate soils. So acid sulfate soils are naturally occurring soils or sediments that have elevated levels of pyrite um, and the pyrite's often framboidal. So a framboidal pyrite looks like the um, photo in the bottom left, which is an electron micrograph. You can see a 10 micron um, scale bar there. Um, it's very reactive. And um, sometimes it's even more reactive because the sulfide is actually a monosulfide. Um, 
like a mineral called gregite, and there's another one, mckinnonite. And they often occur in stuff like in the middle photo there, which is often called monosulfidic black oozes. And um, these are all highly reactive. So on the right-hand photo there is a lagoon along the Murray, um, Bottle Bend Lagoon near Mildura, which dried up during the millennium drought. And as it dried up, the sediments on the bottom of the lagoon, which were acid sulfate sediments, um, oxidized. And that pool of water that you can see in the middle there had a pH of about two, and all the trees around the lagoon died. Um, it was astonishing. But the thing about acid sulfate soils is if you don't expose them to oxygen, they're absolutely fine. So um, they're basically harmless if they're undisturbed, or if you can put them back into a situation where they can't encounter oxygen. Next slide. So just a word about acidity. So acidity um, for acid rock drainage is a bit more complicated than normal because not only do you have H+, plus, um, but you also have dissolved metals. So dissolved metals like iron and aluminium, when they precipitate, they produce more acidity. So aluminium, for example, there you can see when it reacts with water, releases 3H+. Plus and, um, Iron, depending if it was ferric or ferrous, um, does the same. So when you're looking at the amount of acidity in acid rock drainage, it's not just the H+, it's the dissolved metals as well. So pH isn't um, the sole arbiter of how much acidity that will generate when it's neutralised. So it's generally recorded, reported as milligrams calcium carbonate per litre. Um, it, generally increases as pH decreases, so as the pH gets more acidic, obviously the water has more acidity. Um, but you can have water with high acidity but neutral pH if it's got a lot of dissolved metals in it of particular types that are still soluble at neutral pH. So um, it's just an indication that acid rock drainage can generate a lot more acid than you might think just by looking at its pH, and the pH is often low enough anyway. So just in passing, um, there's an acid rock drainage site in the US where the pH is actually negative. Um, so um, the amount of H plus in the water there is truly astonishing. Next slide. So these days at mine sites, a lot of thought goes into um, prevention of acid rock drainage, and I'm not going to go through this in detail because actually I don't work in this. Um, but basically you have to work out whether the material you're mining is likely to produce acid. And for that, it's analyzed in various ways. Um, this particular part of acid rock drainage is a minefield of acronyms, um, of which I've given you just three there, but there are many more. Um, so you basically need to know what the net acid producing potential of your waste material is, tailings or waste rock. And so you can analyze its CRS, which is its chrome reducible sulfur, which is an indication of the sulfur in the rock, which can oxidize to produce acidity. So if you just analyze for sulfur, you'll get sulfates and things like that as well, which won't produce acidity. Having said that, um, if you've got a lot of pyrotide in the rock, um, it may not generate as much acidity as your CRS indicates. And then you also analyze the rock for its acid neutralizing capacity. So limestone has a very high acid neutralizing capacity, but even silicates will react with this acid and neutralize it to some extent. To use that information, um, it determines how the waste rock and the tailings are disposed of. So waste rock these days is often mixed or interlayered um, with neutralizing material, which is typically limestone. And um, that has been very effective at um, quite a number of mine sites. And sometimes it's uh, mixed in lifts and the lifts are separated by clay to reduce the amount of percolation of the water through the waste rock piles. And then there are ways of excluding oxygen. So oxygen is required for pyrite to oxidize. So if you can keep it out, then hopefully you'll stop the whole process beginning. Um, you can cover your waste rock material or your tailing stands with various things like geofabric, um, which will exclude um, pretty much everything. Um, cover it with soil 
plant it with trees, um, make it look nice as well. And also various alkalinity producing materials. Um, limestone again is often used, but um, you can employ directly chemicals like calcium hydroxide, which we'll talk about a bit more as we go along. And the other thing you can do is flood it. So there's about 21% oxygen in the air, but it's actually a surprisingly insoluble gas. So the amount of oxygen in surface water in contact with the air and in equilibrium with it is only eight to 10 ppm. So if you can flood it, uh, your waste rock piles or your tailings dam and keep the water fairly stagnant, that amount of oxygen will be used up quite quickly and then no more oxidation will occur. So putting a layer of water over tailings or filling the underground workings or open cuts with pit lakes um, can be quite effective. However, um, you've got to ensure there's no water circulation because if the water's circulating through it, it's bringing in new oxygen all the time and that will continue the oxidation and acid generating process. Next slide. You mentioned, you mentioned before that uh, once the reaction started, it doesn't necessarily need oxygen to keep going. Yeah. Um, that's an additional, uh, an extra issue in many cases. That's right. Um, if you can keep the oxygen out, so it can be um, oxidized by Fe3 plus, but if you can keep the oxygen out for a long period of time, then you'll cut down the production of Fe3 plus as well. And so eventually you can bring it to a stop. When we say eventually, is it like hundreds of years or is it sort of? Um, well, that depends entirely on how much um, oxygen and if you three plus are in solution, um, how much circulation is going on. It's really an individ individual case. So in many cases, um, and particularly in legacy mine sites, um, no prevention was done. And so acid rock drainage is being generated. And so you need to treat it. And there are many, many different treatment systems. And in this talk, I'm only gonna cover uh, a few of them, ones that we've worked on. There are two basic types, active and passive. So an active treatment system has a plant with mechanical procedure. They add an alkaline reagent and monitor it so it reaches the required pH. Um, these are very effective, um, but they're expensive and they require ongoing daily inputs of power and often um, input from people to monitor, that, monitor what's going on. The idea of a passive system is that um, you put it in place and then hopefully you just walk away. And so there's an in-situ process going on, chemical or biological. There's no mechanical assistance required. Um, you just put it in place and off you go. So on the left is an active system and on the right is an example of a type of passive system. Um, in that case, it's called an open limestone drain where it's just a gully um, that's been lined with limestone gravel and the acid rock drainage just percolates through it. So, um, Alas, there's no passive system that allows you to walk away forever. Um, but they do work to varying extents so that many of them will work for years by themselves before you have to go back and do something about them. But we'll talk about that more as we go along. Next slide. So this is a list of passive treatment methods that um, Jeff Taylor put together a little while ago. And you'll notice a lot of them have got acronyms. Um, we're just going to talk about the ones in red um, using limestone. There are a whole series of other ones there, um, which I've already got some questions about. And so I'll answer those questions at the end of the talk rather than um, go through that now. So we're just going to talk about the limestone drones. Uh, next slide. So limestone is a good neutralizing agent. It's cheap. And it occurs almost everywhere, not quite. Um, it can't raise the pH to greater than 8. 8.2 is the um, pH of seawater, and that's the maximum that you can get using limestone in an acid rock drainage situation as well, but 8's plenty. Um, the big problem with limestone is as it neutralizes the acid drainage, it causes ferric hydroxide to precipitate, and that precipitate coats the limestone gravel or the limestone grains, 
and then after a while it makes them um, inactive. They can't dissolve anything more. And the reason for it is you can see calcium carbonate reacts with H plus to form calcium and um, at low pHs carbonic acid. Um, when Fe3 plus precipitates to ferric hydroxide, it um, releases acidity. So if you use up H plus with the top reaction, you force the bottom reaction <coughs> to go even harder to release H plus that could be used up by the calcium carbonate. And this means that basically armoring of the limestone by ferric hydroxide is actually impossible to stop, um, but you can minimize it. Um, at the bottom on the right, we can just see the surface of a limestone gravel covered in ferric hydroxide. And the left is a cross section through it. The gray in the middle is the limestone. And you can see the ferric hydroxide has formed this layer um, coating it. Next slide. Um, however, um, before talking about ways of trying to minimize that um, precipitation of ferric hydroxide, I just want to point out that limestone has an additional advantage. So when it reacts with um, the acidity, it forms carbonic acid. And carbonic acid will break down to water and CO2 and give off the CO2 to the atmosphere as CO2 degassing. And by doing that, it actually uses up H plus by reversing the bottom reaction that we've got there um, to form carbonic acid to replace the carbonic acid that's lost due to CO2 degassing. We use up H plus. And so this is kind of like a gift that limestone gives you if you've used it. After the reaction, if you can degas the CO2 by aeration or turbulence in some way, you'll get a rise in pH um, that's kind of almost free. And uh, the graph on the right there just shows that um, you get this increase in pH due to CO2 loss. It's been um, verified in quite a number of experiments. Um, next slide. That's the first time I've heard someone talking positively about CO2 emissions in a while, John. Um, oh, CO2, CO2 is my favourite gas, um, but uh, I don't want to get sidetracked. <laughs> so um, Silvana Sandamotino, um, one of my PhD students, worked on limestone drains, and um, she showed a couple of, a uh, few of interesting things about them. So there's two ways that they're used, are the open drains, which I showed a photo of before, or closed drains where you dig a trench, fill it with limestone, um, cover it over, and allow the um, acid rock drainage to percolate through it. And the idea of covering it is to exclude oxygen. So um, you stop the oxidation of Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus and therefore inhibit the ferric hydroxide precipitation. However, um, so when these were first developed, um, there were high hopes for them. But alas, they all failed because you just can't stop that ferric hydroxide precipitation. So inevitably, um, limestone drains will fail, um, no matter how much you try to exclude the oxygen. However, um, they can perform satisfactorily for years before they fail. And um, Silvana developed an equation there that um, is sort of a rule of thumb, really, just showing that um, depending on how much iron's going into them, how much is retained and how big they are, how much water's flowing through, they can last for years. And um, they just need monitoring. And when they have failed, you can go back and um, remove the limestone or um, treat it in a way I'll talk about in the next slide and um, keep doing it for ages. Um, limestone drains are used very extensively and they are effective provided you realize the limitations. Next slide. So the other thing that uh, Silvana found was that the ferric hydroxide crust armoring the limestone is not necessarily very strongly bonded. And um, often in her experiments, there was a void between the crust and the limestone. So what that means is if you agitate the gravel, um, you can break up the crust to some extent and expose the limestone so it can start neutralizing all over again. And um, this is something that is actually relatively straightforward, particularly for open limestone drains, where you can put a bulldozer down the channel with its tines down and um, agitate the limestone, break off the crust and um, get the drain working again. <laughs> 
Next slide. Okay, but also um, in many, many places around the world, active treatment methods are used. And these are very effective um, because you monitor exactly what's going on. You can make sure what you release has exactly the pH that's appropriate for the environment. Um, there are many different active treatment methods also. This is once again, a list compiled by Jeff Taylor. And um, we're only gonna talk about in, or I'm only gonna talk about now the top ones where you actively control the pH by adding um, something to it. Next slide. So the most common neutralizing agent by far is hydrated lime, which is calcium hydroxide. Um, just a little word here about um, lime. So lime is used in different ways. So lime itself, I use for calcium oxide. Um, add water to it, you get calcium hydroxide, which we call hydrated or slaked lime. Limestone is calcium carbonate, and that's often finely ground and called agricultural lime, but it's not calcium hydroxide, it's calcium carbonate. Anyway, hydrated lime is um, easy to get, easy to handle. It's relatively inexpensive. Um, it has a cost and it reacts rapidly. There are lots of other neutralizing agents you can use like sodium hydroxide, magnesium oxide or potassium hydroxide. Um, they're generally more expensive or when they're not necessarily expensive like magnesium oxide in some cases, they're not available um, readily everywhere, only in particular places. Add calcium hydroxide, you can get the pH way up to nine or 11 maybe. Um, the equilibrium pH of calcium hydroxide is actually 12. Um, so that's good. And so what happens when you add it? So you add it to the acid mine drainage and the first thing that happens is you precipitate the iron. And initially it often precipitates as Fe2 plus. Um, so the Iron is released by breakdown of pyrite and it's released as Fe2+, and if that precipitates quickly as ferrous hydroxide or ferrous hydroxide sulfate, um, that's what's often called green rust, which is a dark green precipitate. If you um, oxidize that by aeration or just letting it sit in oxygenated water, the Fe2+, will turn to Fe3+, and it'll turn from green to orange. And initially it'll be a sulfate, um, ferric hydroxy sulfate, which is a mineral called schwertmanite. And then that will eventually over time lose its sulfate and also lose some H plus and transform to a ferrihydrite, ferric oxyhydroxide. And with time, um, now we're talking years, that will transform to a crystalline um, iron oxide mineral like goethite. Um, just on the right there, you can see that um, that change as you lose the sulfate from the initial precipitate and transform it to just an oxyhydroxide, um, the H plus that's released at the same time will drop the pH. Um, so that is something that uh, needs to be kept in mind sometimes. Next slide. Um, along with the precipitation of the iron, you get precipitation of the aluminium. So um, it will precipitate either as amorphous aluminium hydroxide, often called gibbsite, or aluminium hydroxy sulfate, um, basilinite. So the equivalent of schwertmanite and ferrihydrite. Now the other metals in solution, uh, like the copper and zinc and the lead and the cadmium, um, mostly get adsorbed onto the amorphous ferric hydroxide. So ferric hydroxide is a fabulous material for scavenging metals and arsenic, um, just in passing. Um, has a really large surface area per gram, um, like 200 square meters per gram there. It's um, big, so it can absorb a lot of metals. And also because you've added generally a calcium uh, neutralizing agent and there's a lot of sulfate in the water to begin with, gypsum, calcium sulfate will precipitate. And so you end up with a sludge and um, so it's typically orangey brown, like in the bottom left, and contains lots of gypsum crystals, like we can see in the SEM on the bottom right. Next slide. So this is an active treatment plant. Um, you can see the precipitation of the um, material still in suspension on the left, and then it's put out to dewater and uh, dry out and it develops uh, a 
turns into this um, sludge, orangey brown sludge, which you can see on the right. Next slide. Uh, the volumes of sludge can be big. Uh, one site we worked at generated about 3,000 tonnes annually. Um, it's bright coloured, so it's not something you can hide easily. Um, often has quite low density and is quite sloppy, um, so it can be difficult to handle and costly to dispose of. So initial treatments can have as little as 2 to 5 weight percent solids. If the high density sludge process is used, which is um, shown on the bottom right there, which is just where you recirculate the sludge um, back through the neutralization tank, um, that increases the density of the sludge to 35 to 50 weight percent solids, but that's still a lot of water. And you can dewater it and that will make it um, denser still, but still it's relatively low density. Um, some of the stuff we measured like 2.6 grams per cc. And um, there's lots of it and it's brightly colored. So what to do with it? Next slide. So for this, um, Danny McDonald um, did his PhD thesis looking at sludges and uh, what you can and can't do with them. And what he was concerned with is the fact that it's often very convenient to pump the sludges back into the mine. Um, you've got a void right nearby, why not use it? And uh, open cuts also. The trouble with that is the mine and the open cuts often have acid waters uh, circulating through them. And so in terms of long-term storage and stability, that's a bit of an issue. So Danny did quite a lot of testing on these and he showed that as you drop the pH, um, the metals will start to go back into solution. So you can see in the bottom right there, as you drop the pH to just 6.5, the zinc starts to get released back into solution. And next slide. Uh, for copper, once you drop it back below 5.5, the copper starts to go back into solution. And if you drop the pH down to three, you start to redissolve the iron as well. Uh, next slide. So, um, if these sludges come into contact with acid solutions, they will release the metals. And um, you can see the different pHs at which they're approximately released there. And zinc is the one that's released at 6.5, which is um, not much below neutral pH. So you can see that zinc is particularly easily leached. So really, um, the results of his study showed that um, it's not a good idea to put the treatment sludges back anywhere they're likely to come in contact with acid because um, you'll get the metals back into solution and then you'll have to treat them all over again. Um, so this limits disposal options um, to somewhere um, not in the mine. Next slide. Um, one process we looked at was one thing to do is to try and create a more stable sludge, one that's not going to release the uh, metals so easily and one that's easier to handle. And one possibility there was to form a magnetic sludge. So this is a variation of a process that you can see down the bottom there called the ferrite or um, CSR, I worked on it too, called the Soroflop process. And, um, their process was designed to produce very pure, finely grained magnetite. And so for that, they started with basically analytical grade chemicals. Um, so for ARD, which has all these other things in it, we had to look at that um, a bit more carefully. But it has uh, lots of potential. So the more crystalline the minerals are in the sludge, the less leachable they are and also the denser they are because of their smaller grain size. And if you can make it a magnetic sludge um, with magnetite, not only is it more stable and high density, um, it's also magnetic. So that offers the option of making it easier to handle and you can separate out the magnetic and non-magnetic fractions if you so desire. So Wendy Stanford uh, looked at this for her PhD and what did she find? Next slide. 
So first of all, she discovered that um, other people would try to work on this too, and aluminium is a real problem. So if there's al any aluminium in solution, the magnetite won't form. So um, she got around that by using a stepwise process. So she took pH up to around about 4.7 to let the aluminium precipitate, and then um, seeded the slurry. So seeding is something I'm going to mention a few times in this talk. So seeding is just adding small crystals of what you want to precipitate. So if you want to precipitate magnetite, um, if you add small crystals of magnetite, they act as a template effectively for more magnetite to precipitate. Um, and they yeah, provide the nucleation sites, as we say there. And then she neutralized it right through to 11.5. Um, so what she saw happen was initially she got a dark green sludge, which we mentioned before, the ferrous, and then she aerated that and it partially converted um, or partially oxidized to magnetite. So magnetite is Fe3O4, which is actually a mixture of Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. So you want to start with your Fe2 plus and you want to partially oxidize it. So some of it goes to Fe3 plus and you form the magnetite crystals. And by seeding it, she got pretty good results. Um, a nice black magnetic sludge on the left. But if she didn't seed it, it was nowhere near as effective because magnetite precipitates quite slowly. And seeding it speeds up that precipitation. Next slide. Um, it didn't work out quite as well as we would have hoped. So the density of the sludge was much better and it settled out much more quickly. Um, but when she looked at it, um, it wasn't 100% of the sludge. Now, part of that was because um, there was also quite a lot of gypsum in there. As you can see in that X-ray diffraction pattern there, the blue is gypsum and the red is the magnetite. Uh, the green there, I'll just point out, was a zincite that she added to the sample um, so it can be um, more easily, um, the res results can be more easily processed. Um, but it did mean that um, because it's magnetic, um, it's possible to separate out the magnetite from the gypsum if you so desired. Um, subsequent work, which I've actually put on here by people in other research areas around the world has shown that another element interferes with magnetite precipitation and that's one that I haven't mentioned so far, but which is often present in ARD, but which we often overlook because it's not toxic and doesn't create any problems. And that, alas, was silica. And that too interferes with magnetite precipitation. And it's much more difficult to remove from the ARD um, to get magnetite to precipitate. So alas, we weren't able to process or proceed with the magnetite sludge process as far as we would have hoped. Next slide. But Michael Sefton, one of my other students, um, thought, why don't we think outside the box and see if we can use cement? Um, so he used cement in two ways. So the first of them was he put some leach columns together. The one on the left shows the waste rock he was using, and the one on the right shows after he added the cement. And what did he find? Next slide. So he used a variety of water cement ratios. So if you had a fairly low ratio, it was a high viscosity cement. And um, on the left there, we can see a column after um, it's had the cement added, it's been cut in half. So we can just see what's going on inside. And you can see the higher viscosity cement um, coated the waste rock at the top of the column. Um, it didn't form a plug. There are lots of channels that the um, added water could go through. And that meant there was a fairly short contact time between the acid rock drainage and the cement. So what we can see in the graphs down the bottom there is the pH didn't change much, which was a bit of a pity, but the acidity was greatly reduced because the iron precipitated out, remembering that acidity is a combination of dissolved metals and pH. Um, he had oxygen meters on these, seeing how much oxygen was being used up and it showed that the oxygen consumption rate was considerably reduced, so there was less pyrite oxidation going on. And um, because the cement wasn't dissolving very fast, um, it would last decades before it would need to be renewed. 
Okay, so what happened when he made the cement more dilute, um, lower viscosity? It sank right to the bottom of the column, um, where it actually almost plugged the column. Eventually, channels developed through that that um, the water could drain from, but it was pretty slow. And so because um, it almost blocked the column, the low permeability meant there was a long contact time between the ARD and the cement, and that was much more effective at raising the pH, as you can see from the graph, and removing the iron. Um, it reduced the oxygen consumption rates down to 20% of the control columns because there was just so much less pyrid oxidation going on. But there was a lot of calcium in the leachate because of a lot of cement being dissolved. And so in this case, the cement wouldn't last nearly as long, maybe 10 years. But over those 10 years, it would be very effective. Okay. So... What he was able to show is that it reduced the acidity, metal, and sulfate loads. I didn't show you the sulfate graphs there. And this is because not only did it neutralize the acidity, it also um, resulted in encapsulation of some of the pyrite bearing rock fragments, and in particular by the ferric hydroxide that was precipitating out due to the neutralization. The higher viscosity cements would be good for capping. Uh, waste rock or tailings, a lower viscosity cement would be good for deep penetration and sealing the voids. Now, he also thought about, oh, gee, cement's actually pretty expensive. Uh, there are ways of reducing the cost. And if you could dilute it with um, fly ash or even acid rock drainage sludge, would that make a difference? So he trialled that and discovered that the cement with the fly ash and sludge additives still worked quite well. And one of the worries with using acid drop drainage sludge is that the metals involved in it might be released, but um, there was no evidence of that. And so those additives could be used to reduce the cost. Next slide. It didn't stop there. So could you use cement instead of limestone in an open limestone drain, which would become an open cement drain? And so what he did there was to look at these samples here. So on the left is just a bit of cement with um, deionized water going over it. And then we've got um, two samples where acid mine drainage has been run over the cement and on the right, sulfuric acid, just for comparison. And what you can see in the center ones is of course, quite quickly, the cement was coated with ferric hydroxide, just like limestone. So you go, oh gee, no advantage. But you can see how it's starting to crack. And um, that was kind of interesting. So if we look at the next slide, um, what he found was that um, the neutralizing efficiency decreased as the secondary minerals accumulated, particularly ferric hydroxides, as I just said. But a secondary mineral called ettringite was forming because we're using cement rather than limestone. And so the aluminium and the cement was combining with the calcium and the sulfate to form this mineral ettringite. And ettringite, um, when it crystallizes, um, increases in volume. And so what it was doing was it was cracking the crust. So I showed you the cracks in the crust previously. The ettringite was causing the crust to crack. And so the acid rock drainage could penetrate down those cracks. And it meant that there was more neutralization going on than we might initially have thought. And the cracking was particularly enhanced if you enable, if you let the samples dry out um, before you leach them again. So what he found with cement is for passive treatment of acid rock drainage, like in uh, cement drains using concrete rubble, um, that will work quite satisfactorily and it'll work even better if you let it dry out periodically to allow the crust to crack as that ettringite forms. Um, if you wanna use cement in waste rock for a waste rock pile, um, you can use different um, viscosities of cement if you want the cement to stay at the top or go to the bottom of the pile, but it will work better if it stays saturated, which is more likely in a waste rock pile anyway. Next slide. So um, we thought about other things that might help with um, remediation of acid rock drainage. And one of them was there's all these heavy metals there. They're worth quite a lot of money. And so if we could recover them 
as a high purity sulfide, then maybe we could sell that and help defray the cost of the neutralization. So for that, you've only got to look at the Queen River in Queenstown, which I showed you photos of before. It's got uh, an average pH of 2.7 and about 36 milligrams a litre of copper. Now, um, around Queenstown, it rains a lot. So the flow in the river averages um, 2,400 litres a second. And that means there's more than 650 tonnes of copper going down the river every year. And I looked up the price of copper, and at the moment it's $4.30 US a pound, which is $14,000 Australian a tonne, which means there's about $9 million worth of copper flowing down the Queen River at the moment. So that's an incentive. So, but to do anything with it, first of all, you've got to get rid of the other metals. And in particular, you've got to get rid of the iron and the aluminium. So you want to leave just, say, your copper and zinc in solution. So what we did there was we looked at oxidation with an active um, oxidant, a really strong one like hydrogen peroxide. So the advantage there is if your acid rock drainage is um, following the blue arrow, as you increase the pH, as you neutralize it, it will precipitate ferric hydroxide at a pH of around about four or six, depending how oxidized the water is. However, if you can make your water really oxidizing and move the pathway up to the orange arrow, um, it will precipitate the iron at a much lower pH and you can get rid of it much more quickly. And uh, so that was the idea behind using the hydrogen peroxide to make sure that we went from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus really quickly. Aluminium will just precipitate as you raise the pH. So generally by the time you're up around 5.2, all the aluminium should be gone. So let's have a look at the results at the next slide. So the top one is um, no oxidation, just neutralization. And the iron, the aluminium, the copper and the zinc all precipitate together um, by the time you're at a pH of six. So that's no good. If you oxidize with hydrogen peroxide, you can see the blue line, the iron, precipitates at a much lower pH and you can get it out of the way much more quickly. And then the aluminium, which unfortunately in this one is a gray line, whereas it's an orange line in the one above, but you can see by 5.2, pretty much all the aluminium is gone. Um, you can also see that the zinc, which is the yellow line, stays pretty much horizontal, but the orange line in the bottom diagram does start to drop as you get towards 5.2, so some copper gets adsorbed to the um, basaluminite, the aluminium precipitate. Next slide. So Josh filtered the sample um, three times to reduce this problem to the minimum. Um, if he filtered at 3.5, he removed shrapnite at the top there, which is the um, brown ferric hydroxide sulfate. At 4.5, Aluminium starting to precipitate and is just getting rid of the last bit of the iron. And at 5.2, he's removing all the aluminium. And you can see a little blue color there that indicates we couldn't stop some of the copper still adsorbing to the aluminium. Um, in terms of the others, um, that was okay. Um, so then what you've got to do is get the sulfides out. And so for that, we added a sulfide solution, sodium sulfide. And that turned out this beautiful black precipitate on the top left there. And when we did the XRD on it at the bottom, you can see that it's made of copper sulfide and zinc sulfide. So we're over the moon. Wow, we've cracked it. And then we put the samples under the SEM. And what we discovered was they're really, really finely integran. So... Um, the black grains are fine intergrowths of zinc um, and copper sulfide. And they're so finely integran. Uh, you can see the scale down the bottom there's um, submicron that uh, it wouldn't be economic to separate them out. So we wanted them to be separate sulfides so they could be separated by flotation and then um, sold off, but that didn't happen. So what to do? Um, that was a bit of a pity because there's quite a difference in solubility between copper and zinc sulfides, but uh, as you can see there, but alas, these things happen. So um, seeding worked for magnetite, 
let's try seeding for sulfides. And so we seeded it with copper sulfide crystals and they worked um, quite well. So the copper sulfide crystals act as templates for um, more copper sulfide growth and that occurred before the zinc precipitated. So we actually made the difference in solubility between the copper and zinc sulfides there actually work for us um, using the um, seeding. Now, um, that's where these experiments have stopped, but um, one of the possibilities for proceeding further would be to replace the sodium sulfide with a cheaper source of sulfide, like um, reducing sulfate in solution to sulfide using microbial reduction, which is a process called a sulfate reducing bioreactor. Um, but we haven't advanced any further with that at this stage. Next slide. And so the last thing I wanted to talk about um, was an idea that um, Jeff Taylor um, gave us and helped to supervise. And that was, can you change the secondary minerals that are precipitating um, from AMD or ARD to um, maybe sequester, to lock up some of the acidity? And so what we're particularly looking at there is two minerals called jarosite and alunite. So jarosite, I haven't mentioned so far, but it is quite a common precipitate um, from acid rock drainage. Um, it's a bright yellow colour. So the yellow colour that you often see in acid rock drainage is jarosite. It's an iron oxyhydroxide sulphate. Um, there's an isostructural aluminium equivalent, which is alunite. And um, particularly jarosite, but sometimes alunite can form as secondary precipitates from ARD. So why would we bother with these? Next slide. So when jarosite precipitates, um, you can see the top reaction there, potassium ion sulfate gives jarosite and releases 6H plus. So you go, gee, that doesn't seem very successful. But you can see that it uses up three Fe3 plus. And so if the three Fe3 plus precipitated as ferric hydroxide, they'd release nine H plus. But if they precipitate as jarosite, they only release six. So it's actually um, locking up 3H+, which will, of course, be released when the jarosite dissolves. And jarosite's only soluble at low pH, only stable at low pH, below 3. And so as the pH rises, it dissolves. So you can lock it up for a while in the jarosite, but as the pH rises, it will inevitably dissolve and release the acidity back. However, alunite is uh, the reaction for precipitation of alunite is quite similar. 3Al3 plus into alunite, releasing 6H plus, but if those 3Al3 plus precipitated as aluminium hydroxide, they'd release nine. And the beauty of alunite is that it's stable at relatively high pH, so up to uh, around six. So you could maybe lock up some acidity fairly permanently in alunite um, that you can't do with jarosite. So the idea was, can we make alunite precipitate rather than jarosite? And this is what Farah worked on for her PhD. Um, so she used a whole lot of leach columns. I just threw in a photo there um, and various things that put into the leach columns. Um, but the initial experiments were very um, unsuccessful. Um, it's hard to stop jarosite precipitating. It really wants to precipitate. Um, it can outcompete alunite and it can even outcompete ferrihydrite for iron. And um, trying to add organic material to stop the oxidation of Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, um, it just couldn't work fast enough or well enough to stop jarosite precipitation. Jarosite is a real bugger like that. However, Seeding had worked for magnetite, it had worked for sulfides. So we added some alunite seed, or rather Al <coughs> Farah added it. And um, when she added alunite seed, it worked really quite well. And she was able to get um, alunite to precipitate and it could outcompete jarosite for the potassium in solution and effectively um, stop the jarosite precipitating and precipitate a mineral that's likely to remove some acidity on a fairly long-term basis. Okay, so 
what I've done there is cover through some of the things we've worked on. And um, quite a bit of it has been written up, probably not as much as we should have over the years. So there were some journal articles and next slide, quite a few conference papers as well in various ICARD conferences and Australian workshops. And if you want to know more, you can check some of those. So Richard, did you, did you want to take over now? Sure. Uh, thanks very much, John. Really impressive. And uh, I guess it probably highlights uh, the benefit of sticking at a, at a subject and just researching that same problem to try and solve things. Uh, some key lessons learned. It is a significant challenge for the mining industry. Um, we saw some pretty confronting slides up around the Murray River there showing that acid sulfate soil is also a significant challenge for us. Um, limestone works very well for passive neutralisation of acid mine drainage, but there are some challenges we saw with the coating precipitates that occur, but also uh, some pretty pragmatic solutions using dozers to break off that crusting. Uh, John mentioned seeding many times, so seeding uh, was something that I wasn't familiar with when uh, I first read the slides, but it is uh, seeding with some of the precipitates that you're looking to get, um, and uh, that was found to significantly improve neutralisation processes. I guess a couple of other things that came up was that cement did seem to work pretty well, as another solution. And uh, sludge remains a, a challenge for people to work with. But um, we will now move to the Q&A. We had some early bird questions, which I'll go to first, and then we'll go to the questions that have been raised. So the first question, John, is could the use of sulfate reducing bacteria for metal precipitation and alkalinity production be a possibility? Um, so the answer to that one's yes. So there are sulfate reducing bioreactors that are used at um, a variety of sites now, and also um, some sites where they've made wetlands um, that have sulfate reducing bacteria within them. And um, they do remove um, the acid and iron and uh, basically remediate the ARD. The only drawback with them and I think it's a significant one, is that what they do is they precipitate pyrite. So what you end up with is a whole lot of organic material um, through which is scattered fine-grained fine pyrite. And if you let that come in contact with oxygen, you will get all that acidity removed back again really quickly. So disposal of the material within the sulfate-reducing bioreactors or the wetlands is a key to make sure that it um, can't possibly oxidise. Right. Next question. Has any ARD remediation system included antimicrobial features to reduce microbially facilitated sulphide oxidation? Um, yes, they have. Um, to the best of my knowledge, this hasn't been trialled so much recently, but um, early on there were quite a few um, uses of bactericides which were scattered over tailings um, and um, waste rock dumps. Um, they don't last very long. So the bacteria are just out there everywhere. So you can kill them all on a dump. But the minute the bactericides all disappear, as they eventually do, those bacteria will just come straight back again. Um, sulfate, rec back <coughs> sulfate oxidizing bacteria, sulfide oxidizing bacteria are just floating around in the air all the time. So for our experiments, we didn't, use to, we didn't have to inoculate them with bacteria. The bacteria just arrive floating in through the window of the lab. That's interesting to know. Um, next question. What other means of sealing slash waterproofing acid mine drainage material are being looked into, e.g. silica, solid gels, et cetera? 
Um, so there was a company um, that marketed a product which would encapsulate um, acid mine drainage, um, encapsulate acid producing material like waste rock with a silica coating with the idea of permanently locking it away. Um, what they used was a mixture of um, fine grained amorphous silica and calcium hydroxide. Um, because the calcium hydroxide, when you added water, calcium hydroxide made the solution very alkaline. That put the silica into solution. You added that to the um, waste rock and that brought the pH down and automatically precipitated the silica. Um, it sounded like it would work really well, but in the long term, it wasn't successful. And in particular, because it was really hard to get a cheap um, source of finely divided silica. They tried using rice husks and they just didn't work very well. Um, so silica gels um, have been trialled but not been so effective. Um, the other means of sealing um, waste rock dumps and um, tailing stamps I mentioned during the um, talk. Okay. It's a more personal message for you. Hi, John. Was any further research conducted on the use of quartz in the treatment of acid rock drainage after my honours project in 2002? So this is really embarrassing. I have no record of using quartz in an honours project in 2002. Could this person please contact me and I'd be very happy to answer your question and I really apologise. I mean, I just don't recognise that project. I'm very sorry. Perhaps you could just put something in the Q and A if yeah. that person's Thanks. listening. That'd be great. Next one: the difference between organic and mineral acids, and why associating likeness between acid substances based on pH is ineffective. Um, so organic acids aren't really an issue for acid rock drainage because the uh, mineral acid, sulfuric acid, is just so much stronger than any organic acids that are likely to be generated by oxidation of organic material and things like that. And um, the difference between acidity and pH um, I covered in a previous slide where you have to take into account dissolved metals as well as pH. Next question. How do you quantify the amount of potential acid drainage at one particular site? So I did cover this briefly. Um, it's important to do the analyses on the waste rock material and the tailings at the site in terms of the potential for them to release acidity based on their chrome reducible sulfur content and their acid neutralizing capacity. And there are um, well-developed protocols um, for that. The last of the early bird questions, how soon can reclamation and rehabilitation processes make the abandoned mines sites habitable? Whoa, that's a difficult one. It depends on the size of the site, um, how easy it is to treat it, how accessible it is. Um, that's really how long is a bit of string. Um, so I've seen sites um, that were... Um, they completed mining and they cleaned up the site. And to be frank, I'm not a botanist, but um, I walked around the site, they'd replanted and revegetated, and I couldn't tell where the mine was. Um, that one had been really successful and there was no generation of acid mine drainage there. Um, I've been to other sites where I, I'm, I can't imagine how they could ever re rehabilitate it, to be frank. And um, some of them are just so large and the the uh, pollution extends so far, um, the amount of money involved can be really significant. So um, small sites um, you can clean up in potentially within a year, large sites, you're looking at long-term um, treatment. And some of them, there's no end in sight for, for particular sites, you can calculate how much sulphide's there, how long it will take for all of it to oxidise, and the answer is hundreds of years. Um, potentially, you might have to treat them indefinitely. Well, some of the sites I've been involved in have been there nearly 100 years now and generating assets, so yeah, it is a long-term challenge. Um, let's go to the Q&A. Oops, right. Oh, 
Here it is. All right. Well, we've only got four more questions to go, John. You've done really well. A uh, question from Anthony Barkway. What would be the best way to mitigate acid rock drainage during piling? Also, if acid rock is intercepted during piling, how long will the acid generation continue for post-piling? And what would be the best, best way to limit the reaction post-piling? Okay, so um, for piling, I think you might be talking about acid sulfate soils uh, in many cases. Um, we're going through um, relatively unconsolidated material that does contain pyrite. Um, so at some of those sites, um, I've seen them mix the um, acid-containing material at the surface <coughs> with a neutralising agent. Um, you can use agricultural lime in this case. Um, so that uh, it doesn't generate acidity um, even. So any acidity that's generated is immediately neutralized. Um, so it's possible on sites like that to remediate it um, on site so that no um, acid drainage is generated. Right, next question from Tony Williams. Does active management release a lot of precipitate requiring management also? We've spoken to that to some degree. Um, so the answer is just yes. <laughs> yeah, it sure does. Okay. Excellent answer, John. Um, next question from Anurda Karavita Arachi. Will you be able to share these slides after the webinar? Yes. Uh, recordings are on the HydroTerra website. If you go to the About Us section, you'll find webinars. And there's video recordings of all of these presentations that we've done. Lauren Edmonds. Hi, John and Richard. No question, just a hello to John from Tracy Hassel. Oh, wow. I, yep, I remember Tracy. Excellent. Yeah. I currently worked with Tracy and mentioned that she had been given a shout out. So she asked me to say hello. Well, there you go, John. Bit of a reunion. Yep. Um, Kayara Crook, it appears that based on today's presentation, there is actually no solution to acid mine drainage. Is there a preferred or standard approach at all, even as a place to start? Um, so um, I should restate that at many mine sites now, um, they analyse their waste rock and their tailings and they... Um, dispose of them in a way that minimises or completely prevents acid drainage um, by adding neutralising agents in various ways. Um, so um, prevention is possible. Um, the treatment procedures that I've gone through um, will all treat acid mine drainage so that the drainage coming out of the site is neutral pH and doesn't contain toxic heavy metals. Um, it's just that they all involve um, expense of different types and um, the passive ones require monitoring so that when they start to fail, they can be rehabilitated. Um, but all those procedures will um, allow water to leave the site um, at a um, composition that's compatible with not harming the vegetation or ecosystems in the drainage. I Gara, things are better than they look, is what I heard there. Um, Anthony Barquay just wanted to confirm it is acid rock rather than acid oh. sulfate soil. Okay. Um, so in that case, um, the um, normal procedures at a mine site of um, analysing for its um, chrome reducible sulphur and acid neutralising capacity, and then um, if it has to be disposed of on site, you'd have to add a neutralising agent to it, which could be limestone, um, where you're disposing of it. And if it's piling, then perhaps you can dispose of it below the water table, which will certainly um, make the generation of acid drainage much less likely. Now we're moving into the reunion mode with some of these messages. Silvana Santo Martino. John, it was Glenn Marriott's honours project in 2002. Uh, Quartz used in addition to limestone in the... ALD. 
Right, yes, now I remember. And uh, I wondered if it was Glenn's. But um, no, we didn't do any more work on that. Um, in fact, I can't even directly recall why we didn't pursue, pursue it. But um, no, it wasn't pursued. Okay. Um, Sylvana also says, hope you're well. Um, Perhaps Tanya... she's one too. <laughs> Tanya Keys, also a hello to John. <laughs> From an old student. Sounds like you need to organise a reunion, John. Uh, <laughs> does, does. A lot of disciples out there and uh, you've obviously done some great work. Um, hang on. Something <laughs> we're going to be here for a while now. Um, Tell you worked on an acid sulfate soils project just in passing. Okay. Christy Williams. Fantastic talk. Thanks, John. I'm curious about metal loaded sludge. You've mentioned what you can't do with it. So what does happen to it. <laughs> um, people dump it all over the place. I don't want to go into it any further than that. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, some of it's actually uh, um, disposed of at um, hazardous waste sites. It, it builds up to a fair tonnage though, right? Oh, That's yeah. part of what you were saying. Yeah, it does. Anthony Barkway's back. Piling on large road infrastructure projects, southern part of Wollongong area, oh. which is an acid rock risk area at about 10 milligram at 10 metres below ground level. Okay. That's right. interesting. In that case, um, you definitely need to get the CRS um, done, analysis done on the material to see if it actually does pose a hazard. Yeah, the volume would add up. Yeah. Um, Martin O'Rourke. A bit off the topic, but if you dewater acid sulfate soils during a temporary dewatering activity when the groundwater is withdrawn, the acid sulfate soil can start to oxidise and problems can start. When the groundwater comes back with it, oh, will it stop the process, I think is what that meant. Um, so the answer is um, yes, it will. Um, but there might be a time lag there because the groundwater that comes back um, may contain oxygen in it that allows the process to proceed for some time. Um, but once that oxygen is used up, then um, the acid sulfate soils will go back to being um, their normal selves. And um, if you re-establish reducing conditions in the acid sulfate soil, then the acidity that's been generated can actually back react and form pyrite again and remove the acidity. So a reflooding is um, definitely the way to go. That's interesting. Okay. Um, Alistair McClay, any familiarity with gypsum stacks in Phosphate Hill, a unique issue in Australia? Question mark. Mm, That's a tricky. No, no familiarity with that issue at all. Sounds interesting though. It sounds interesting. Alistair, you've stumped us with the last question of the day. Well, John, that brings us to the end of the questions. Many thanks for that presentation today. I thought it was fantastic and um, really impressive um, range of research that's gone on in a, a really applied way. So uh, many thanks for your contribution both to today and to that research. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody.